Hi, I'm Don Foss. I'd like to discuss something I know a lot about, used cars. While the other dealers are screaming and flying around, I'm talking seriously. I'll give you a great deal on a quality used car for only $99 down. Credit problems, I can finance you. Stop by. I'll give you a good deal on a great used car without a lot of nonsense. Hi, I'm Peter Carey, and today I'm going to guide you through the story of a truly remarkable man. From a single dirt lot in Detroit, Michigan, to the world's largest used car dealer and founder of credit acceptance, Don Foss made subprime auto financing an industry standard. Join us as we talk to Don about how he got his start in the industry, how he built his dealerships, the keys to his success, why he started credit acceptance, and of course, some of the successes and challenges along the way. So Don, your story pretty much epitomizes the great American dream. I mean, humble beginnings to great success, and I'm sure everybody out there wants to know how you did it. How'd you get your start in the car business? Well, actually, uh, my dad was in the car business, and uh, when I was a kid working uh, on the car lot after high school and on the weekends and so on, I learned a little bit about the car business, but later as I, uh, when I got out of high school, I decided I, make, I needed to make a little extra money, so I bought an old tow truck for $450 and went around buying junk cars, and I could take them to Elport Scrap and Salvage and sell them for $36, so anything I could buy for less than that, I, that was my profit. Wow. So you eventually started your own lot? Well, what happened was I, I uh, started buying a few cars that... Um, uh, were actually better than the one I was driving, so I couldn't take that to Elport, so I had to uh, clean it up and get it ready. I'm going to sell it on the weekends and out of the driveway, and uh, after I, it seemed like I was doing pretty good buying them, and, uh, but they started to back up on me, so I rented a little lot on Livernoy for uh, $35 a month. I could really? you know, get three cars on the front line, 35, it was 35 foot frontage, so a buck a foot. So, Don, did you have a mentor when you first got started, somebody to guide you along? Well, of course, my dad was always a big help to me. And I remember one of the early lessons that made a big impression on me was he told me that, uh, remember, you can't sell anything by saying no. And so every customer that I had, I would try and make my presentation so that I would always make it in a positive manner and never never say no. Even sometimes when the question was, only question you could have or answer you could have was no, I'd, I'd do it a different way. I'd try and figure out a way that... I would make it uh, some way that I'm saying yes. In fact, I even made a commercial about it one time. This is Don Foss of Don Foss Auto World. He suffers from a rare disorder known as negophobia, the inability to say no. Allow me to demonstrate. Don, may I hit you with this fish? Yes. Don is undergoing intensive therapy, but you still have time to get financing on a Don Foss quality used car. He can't say no. Don, can I get financing with bad credit? Yes. No credit? Yes. Bankruptcy? Yes. Can I have a peanut butter in your hair? See Don Foss now. Negophobia is a limited time disorder. Another lesson that uh, I learned early on was that my dad told me that if you don't ask, you don't get. And um, one thing, I th we always joke about it, that uh, there must be a customer school someplace because every customer who comes on the lot always has $500. <laughs> so I found out that if you... Uh, gave the customer a chance to pick out a car that they liked and you showed them what it took to get it that usually that five hundred dollars would always seem to increase a little bit which it uh they'd come up with more money and uh now we had a good starting point to sell a car Don, what were some of the initial challenges you faced starting out <laughs> everything was a challenge when i first started of course but mainly it was uh financing and uh, i knew that to uh, be able to sell a car you had to have financing uh, basic premise in those days was that we'd get enough money down to cover the cost of the vehicle and finance our profits. And so I would plow all my profits back into the business. My intention was to grow a business, and uh, I wasn't afraid to invest my profit back into it, and I did that for the next 20 years. So how did you decide who you were going to finance? Well, actually, I had a, uh, a line that I used to use with everybody was that I could finance anyone if I like you. <laughs> and it always seemed like I always liked them 
more the more money they put down. There you go. But financing that way, weren't, weren't you a little worried you were going to lose money? No, no. I, I, you know, I, I bought my own cars. Again, the premise of this was that uh, we were getting enough money down to cover the cost of the car, so I'm financing my profit. My dad always told me that uh, you make money with the cars on the street, not on the lot. Don, from 1967 through the 1980s, you go from a single gravel lot in Detroit to 17 dealerships in six states. That's huge success. What was the key to the growth there? Well, of course, it was the financing. Uh, I think I realized somewhere down the line as a buy here, pay here dealer that um, I was the friendly car salesman one week and the following week I'm the money grubbing bill collector. <laughs> I didn't like that part of it. I, I, I like selling cars. I like the car business. But I wasn't very good at the collections. And I knew that since our profits were tied up in the financing, that if I was ever going to make more profits, we had to get better at collections. And so we started credit acceptance for that purpose. That's where I, it came into the picture. Yep. Okay. Got the professionals in there who could actually run the finance part of it and the collections. Of course, this allowed me to concentrate on selling cars, something I did like and something we were good at. And we were able to build a process for that. And uh, at the same time, uh, we could offer something that other dealers couldn't. We could sell them a nice car, and we could also give them a second chance to reestablish your credit or start new credit. And now, I understand that as you built your team, you started these Friday night board meetings. What can you tell us about those? Well, actually, it was, uh, we called it the board meeting, but really it was the uh, predecessor to our National Dealer Partner Council that we have today. But what it was, it, the dealers in the area would uh, come up to credit acceptance on Friday night, drop off their deals. We always seemed to get together and uh, start uh, talking about the business that we had written that week and things that we had learned. We kind of shared our ideas together. And it, um, of course, always helped that Bob Duro always kept uh, or had some cold beer around there for us. So <laughs> made it a lot easier. But uh, we, uh, we learned from one another. We learned how to uh, perfect the business. And we d it, it worked out great. We weren't afraid to uh, share our ideas. And, uh, and we found that we all did better. So as you continued to grow, how did you continue to expand your customer base? Well, of course, when I first started, I didn't have a big budget for advertising. But one thing my dad always told me was that if you wanted to sell left-handed screwdrivers, you had to advertise for left-handed screwdrivers. <laughs> so uh, we developed TV advertising, and it was something that we could uh, amortize over all the lots. So it, uh, it became affordable for us. They say that when you advertise, it, it takes a while to see results. I mean, did you see a lag in your case? Well, actually, we got results immediately. You could tell when a TV ad was running because the phone would just light up. And so one of the things that we had to do was get prepared for that influx of business. You know, you spend a lot of money in advertising and uh, you don't want to waste it. Uh, so that was really the beginning to, of our uh, phone up uh, process. And we treated a, a phone call just like it was a customer on the lot. It was as important. Of course, we're paying for it. We don't want to lose it. Don Foss with a viewer quiz. Question one. What can you get at a Don Foss used car lot? A. Fresh produce. B. Latex novelties. C. A quality used car for $99 down. Question number two. Don Foss financing requires A. Full frontal nudity. B. Slipping something into my coffee. C. Not much. Even if you've had credit problems, I can finance you. If you answered A or B, come see me anyway. I think I have the perfect car for you. Don Foss used cars. Now, I understand that you won several awards for your television commercials. How come you never played yourself, though? Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> I, uh, you know, that's one thing. You got to know what you're good at and or what you feel comfortable with anyway. And I, I'm certainly not comfortable in front of the camera. If I look like Robert Redford or something, maybe that would be a good spot for me. But I, uh, I was able to get somebody else to do it, and that way I could walk around the dealership. I'd be anonymous to everybody. Well, let's go be anonymous. Good. <laughs> well, if you got no credit, the boss can guarantee you'll get it. The boss, he's the boss. You need a call, he'll come call. So, Don, up until now, we pretty much focused on your dealership experience. Let's turn to Credit Acceptance Corporation and how it got started. You first started Credit Acceptance, what, five years after you started selling cars? Yeah, about 1972. Okay. Did you pay yourself in advance up front? No, no. We just, it was an 80-20 split right from the beginning. And I think the math worked out. In fact, if we had a 90% collection rate, then we were actually getting a, about full price for the car if we uh, stayed within that range. Let's talk about other dealers. When and why did you start financing contracts for them? 
Actually, it started with a friend of mine, uh, Greg Carr, who was a wholesaler, and he brought a car to the lot one day, and uh, we were walking around, and he was kind of admiring the lot, and he said, boy, this is really a neat operation. He said, I'd love to have a, a lot like this someday. And uh, I, I like Greg. He was a real honorable type guy. I says, well, why don't you just go find a location? I'll help you do it. And um, he says, what do you mean? How, wouldn't I just be extra comp or more competition for you? And I said, Greg, I've already decided that I can't sell every car in town, but I can get a piece of every deal in town. Uh, through the financing. Excellent. How about the advance concept? How'd that come into being? Well, that was some years later. I, in fact, I think we had uh, been in business uh, probably about 15 years. And uh, we had, I, I'd say, maybe about 15 or 20 dealers on the program. Uh, there was a dealer uh, locally who did, he was a Ford dealer, and he did some buy here, pay here. And he was a little unhappy with his results. And another dealer had told me about it. So I went over to see him. and. Um, and as we discussed it, I said, well, if I could give you a uh, way to um, double your cash flow, uh, would you be interested? He said, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went back, and, and uh, about a week later, I came back to him, and, and I had uh, got this bright idea for the advance uh, in the shower. There's always a great place to get <laughs> ideas. So. There you go. And uh, worked out the math with him, and that was the beginning of our advance programs. Why did you decide to take credit acceptance public? Well, during the 80s, we had been expanding the business, and uh, we had made some pretty big investments in technology, uh, moving from a ledger card system to a computer that gave us unlimited capacity. We also had a number of dealers calling us from all over the country who were interested in the program. It was a good model. It worked, seemed to work for everyone. Did you have to change the way you did business to take it public? Well, we never changed the business. I had to um, get a lot better at the accounting department. We did. We brought in some uh, pretty strong accounting people and developed a, an accounting system, that, uh, uh, reporting systems that you needed for the SEC and so on. Uh, in fact, that's where we, uh, when we hired Brett Roberts, as a matter of fact, I think he was only about 24 years old and he had accounting background. And I remember uh, after working with him for... Uh, sometime and uh, I remember telling somebody, I said, you know, that kid's going to make a great CEO someplace. I, I hope it's here at Credit Acceptance, but I know he'll be a CEO someday. I joined Credit Acceptance back in 1991. I knew Don was planning on taking the company public and I planned on sticking around for a couple years, learning what I could, and then going back to school. I had an accounting background, so I started as the assistant controller. The first time I met Don, I remember him asking me why the controller needed an assistant. The second time I met Don, he handed me the monthly electric bill and said he was glad to have someone around who could figure out why the electric bill was so high. I remember thinking I wasn't going to make it two years before heading back to school. As it turned out, I made it 16 years and counting. And by the way, Don, I never figured out why the electric bill was so high, but I did get the address changed so you never saw it again. Taking a company like Credit Acceptance Public in such a such a high-risk, fledgling industry had to be a tough sell to Wall Street. Why do you think your public offering was successful? Well, in 1992, we were uh, in business over 20 years. We had a successful track record, and uh, we had a company that focused on the basics. Uh, also, it was um, we were rather unique in that we had no debt. One of our early investors was a fellow by the name of Tom Triforis, who was a big supporter of ours and uh, always understood the business. And we invited him on the board in 1999, and he continues to be a uh, great uh, source of uh, advice. And I think if anybody can tell you why credit acceptance is a good investment, it's somebody like, like him. The great thing about investing in the stock market is that you have a, an opportunity to invest in the greatest companies in the world and the greatest managements in the world by buying a few shares, and you could do it instantly. And I think credit acceptance fits that description at least as well as any company that I know. They have a long history of providing a product that's very difficult to provide, a long history of providing it at least as well as anybody else. And it's a product that provides real value, changes lives for their customers,
for their dealers, for their employees, and for their shareholders. And most importantly, uh, they're run by a management team that is led by Don Foss and Brad Roberts, who through their actions have earned my trust, my admiration, and my respect over a very long period of time. So it's 1992 and you take the company public quite successfully. I mean, you have tremendous growth over the next five years. What kind of challenges arose out of that? Well, you know, when you go public, the one thing that um, I didn't realize is that you actually tell everybody what you do. And I think it attracted a lot of competition. One of the questions I used to get from uh, analysts was that, uh, what were the barriers to entry? Uh, my answer was always, uh, I can't think of any barriers to entry, but I can think of a lot of barriers to making a profit. Uh, unfortunately, th that didn't prevent um, 37 other companies going public after that. And uh, of course, it became a very competitive market and to compete. Uh, we had changed our business model, made it more difficult to uh, raise capital, and our collection suffered because of it. We had to get back to basics in the late 90s. So what happens then? I mean, you went back to your, your proven game plan, right? Yeah, exactly. And Well, once the, the 37 other companies, of course, dwindled down to about three or four, the others all went bankrupt. So why do you think you survived when the others didn't? Well, I think, of course, it's our focus on collections. You know, it's easy to give money away. It's a lot more difficult to collect it back. You know, collecting isn't easy. Uh, Mike Noblock, our chief operating officer, spends the majority of his time thinking about collections and how to improve his collection department. And in fact, for years, our offices were right next to each other when we, we talked about it all the time. I got started in the collection side of the business around 1994 when Don asked me to take over the collection department. Up to that point, I was the controller for his 17 dealerships. And I think the biggest reason he asked me to take the job at the time is I declined it from the first guy who asked me and said no to the second guy too. So I basically got TO to the best closer in the business. But on that day, Don said two things that, that really stuck with me. One of them was that he said I, he thought that I cared about the customers. And that meant a lot to me because he was right, and he saw that in my dealings at the dealership. And the other thing he said to a real young guy at the time was that he'd teach me what he knew. And to think that I could learn from someone that successful was really kind of a dream come true. Um, today, you know, collecting from hundreds of thousands of customers is a complicated business. Uh, and it's tough to execute every day. You have to have very interconnected processes and sophisticated technology. Today we have hundreds of people across the globe, really. Uh, but it all comes back to some basic things that I learned in the early 90s from Don. And one of those things, and maybe the most important, is that the source of the cash for our business. And the source of the cash is the customer. And whether I'm talking to a friend on the weekend or a dealer or someone from Wall Street or a brand new collector, that's what I'm talking about. We have two things to do set the customer up for success when they get the car at the dealership and if they decide not to pay do our best to persuade them to do so and how do you persuade someone to do so that's another thing Don and I talked a lot about is respecting the customer they deserve our utmost respect no matter the situation and I think that's pretty simple because only a small percent of the people really don't intend to pay most of the customers are just trying to do their best and I think that's what we try to do every day is match what they're trying to do so at the end of the day, those are the two things that, that meant the most to me. Um, maybe the last thing was to be patient. Um, that meant something different to Don than I think most people. Patient means never giving up. And even today, I'll get a note from a dealer or a phone call thanking us for a back-end check from 10 years ago. And really, they're thanking the wrong guy. They're thanking me, and they should be thanking Don. I understand you didn't actually have a sales force at credit acceptance until shortly before you went public. How could you attract new dealers without, say, the reputation you have now? We did have some very successful dealers on the program at the time, and uh, they could be a good testimonial for our success. We could refer other dealers who are interested to talk to them. And Actually, we had a postcard we used to just send out that said, we finance everyone. Of course, those are magic words to car dealers. So we had a lot of interest from that. And just from the postcards, we were able to attract some great long-term dealers. Probably the most important date in McCluskey Chevrolet's history was about 18 years ago in 1989 when I was going through that day's mail and came across a postcard or a piece of junk mail that said financing for everyone. 
well, only selling 10 or 15 used cars a month and having a lot of turndowns through big banks like GMAC, I wondered how this company called CAC or Credit Acceptance could do this. So I called the name on the postcard, Dean Bunning, and he came down to the dealership, answered all of our questions, but still wanted to talk to a real world dealer that was utilizing this program. So he gave me Rob Robbins' name from Crestwood Dodge in Detroit. And I called Rob right away and he was opening his mail that morning and he said, funny that you call, just go over to your fax machine and you'll become a believer. So I went to the fax machine and sure enough, as it kind of peels out in that old 1989 technology, was a $125,000 check. And that was his monthly back end profit. So I'm super excited now because we hadn't made that much money in the whole decade of the 80s. So, you know, real excited. Rob answered some more questions. And then I wanted to actually see the operation and maybe talk to Don Foss himself, make sure it's a real guy and et cetera. So Dean got me his number and I called Don and just, he seemed like a great guy on the phone. And I jumped in my demo and headed up to Detroit met Don at an old abandoned Chevrolet store in the shadows of Tiger Field and you know Don answered all my questions and and anybody that knows Don you know you just know he's a great guy but then it was also just great to shake hands with and meet a great car guy I mean the world's largest used car dealer through the 70s and 80s by perfecting the program of you know saying yes to everyone and being the car dealer and the bank and now little McCluskey Chevrolet he had the opportunity to be a part of this we came back super excited, uh, signed up on the program, and, and since then have utilized the power of guaranteed credit approval to become Ohio's number one Chevy dealer in total new and used vehicle sales. We've grown into the Mission Automotive brand and plan on cloning those and growing geographically with the power of guaranteed credit approval. So he's changed thousands of lives in Cincinnati, certainly mine, certainly our employees. Uh, very appreciative to it, and thank you, Don. We got started with credit acceptance at Paradise Motors in 1991. I was actually looking for a finance company at that time. My good friend Rob Frederick was working at Shan Pontiac in Florida, and he was, had a company named Mercury Finance. Uh, and because I was an independent, they wouldn't they wouldn't sign us up at all. And and I, we didn't have a lot of options other than local banks and credit unions. And I had a lot of people, and I thought four or five a month that you know maybe I could finance through a special finance company of some sort. And uh, but I couldn't find anybody to do it. And uh, I, one day I got a, a hard postcard in the mail from Credit Acceptance with Greg Carr was the salesman. And uh, so I responded and I called Greg and he told me how he, you know, his, told me his story about he sold cars at a Ford dealership and how he started his own lot and Don Foss uh, financed him and he had this collection. He told me how much money he got and I said, yeah, 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 two million bucks, sure, you know. And uh, But anyway, he encouraged me and coached me into driving to Detroit and I went to the Civic Center building at the time, which they had just moved into, and I'll never forget, I, I walked in the building and there was no walls, it was just studs. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, Nelly. <laughs> and uh, they finally encouraged me to give them the check for $4,500 uh, at the time, and we signed up, and I was so excited on the way home. I, I had a couple of deals that I kind of had pigeonholed and got home and did my first deal, and I forgot to add the sales tax, and I lost the money on the tax. So I lost money on my first deal. Uh, but we've had a great relationship with Credit Acceptance, and Don Foss has been a steadfast leader uh, in training, uh, an example of his own car lots, and now I think we're, uh, we're 16 years later, 5,000 contracts and 5 million bucks, and that's changed our life, and I want to thank you, Don Foss, and Credit Acceptance for all you've done. So, Don, after having built Credit Acceptance Corporation into a successful multinational public company, what made you decide to turn over its leadership to your management team in 2002? Well, you know, I still love the car business. I started Credit Acceptance for the purpose of concentrating on the car business. And uh, we have a young management team, but they all have over a decade of experience at Credit Acceptance. And I really think that uh, today w they make the best management team in the business. When people find out I'm the CEO of Credit Acceptance, they usually wonder how I'm related to Don. How do you know Don, they say. Well, for the record, I'm not related to Don Foss. In fact, I hadn't met him before I started with Credit Acceptance. But Don's created a great company where if you work hard, you have an opportunity to fulfill your potential, whatever that happens to be. In fact, most of the senior management team consists of people who have been here a long time and have worked their way up through the company. Don has a great talent for believing in people. In fact, the whole premise of Credit Acceptance is based on Don's belief in our customers that if we give them a second chance, they'll be successful. 
He views the employees the same way. He never focused on my mistakes and gave me a great chance to learn and a great environment to have a successful career. I'd been working for Credit Acceptance for about five years in the UK when it became clear that we were going to shut down the, uh, the operation over there. Brett explained that he and Don would like me to come and work over here in North America. He said that they didn't know what they would pay me or quite what they'd have me do, but they'd like me to come and work anyway. I said, well, since you make it sound so compelling, how, how can I say no? And my point was that, or my point is that in a heartbeat, I decided to bring my wife and kids 3,000 miles across the Atlantic uh, and start a new life over here based on my confidence in Brett and Don and in the credit acceptance business model. Uh, I really haven't looked back uh, since. Now, I would just share with you my experience on, on first arriving here. I, I had no credit rating to speak of, and then Don had kindly agreed to supply me with uh, a couple of demonstration cards straight from the auction. I thought, wow, this is the kind of lifestyle I could become accustomed to, this sort of movie star existence. I was soon reminded of our chairman's austere nature. However, uh, when, the, uh, when the cars arrived from the auction, uh, I jumped in the one that my wife decided I was going to be driving, eager to make a good impression on my first day at my, uh, my new job. Quickly had to, um, had to elect for plan B, however, which was a one mile walk down Telegraph and a long 12 mile when the car wouldn't start. Uh, I got to the office and I found Don had really rolled out the red carpet. He'd actually got me an office, but I had no chair, no computer, and, and no telephone. Uh, my point in sharing that, that story with you is I think that tells you a little bit about what credit acceptance is, stands for. And we're really a no-frills company. The whole goal is to get the right people uh, in the company, um, give them as much freedom as we can. They'll work it out for themselves, and they'll add as much value as they're capable of adding. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I've enjoyed the first 10 years, and I'm really looking forward to the next 10 years. So now that you're not managing credit acceptance on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, what are you doing with all this spare time? <laughs> well, I still have three car lots. I, um, I, Mark Horvath, who used to work at credit acceptance, is the operating partner. Uh, but I, they still let me stick my nose in once in a while. And I uh, actually I was at the auction last week, and uh, I think they all get a little nervous when I go to the auction. I, I don't think maybe I'm as good a buyer as I used to be. It's interesting now that I've moved over to the retail side, the lessons from Don are the same. Hire the best people you can, give them the tools they need to be successful, and measure everything. He likes to say, inspect what you expect. And what better mentor to have than the world's largest used car dealer? Don, your story truly is inspiring. I mean, from your undying passion for the car business to your philosophy of putting the right people in the mix and sticking to processes that work, they've, they've all contributed to your success. In parting today, is there anything you'd like to share with dealers out there about how they can unlock their profit potential and reach their own goals? Well, you know, running a successful business is really a simple concept. You have to decide what you want to do. You have to find the right people, people who have the same passion and goals that you do. You have to train them, and you have to give them the tools to achieve their goals. You know, selling cars today is the same as when I started. I, of course, we've got technology that makes it easier and better, but our customers have the same challenges, and we have to help them resolve them in the best way that we can with respect and empathy. Don, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thanks, man. Hey, well, all right, sir, here we go there, what are they going to give for them? I'm a $600 down here now, 10 and now, 25 and now, 35 and now, the 50 now, 60, will they give me 60 now, 75, 75 and now, 85 and all of a sudden there. There was a boy in Arkansas who wouldn't listen to his ma when she told him he should go to school. He'd sneak away in the afternoon, take a little walk, then pretty soon you'd find him at the local auction barn. He'd stand and listen carefully, then pretty soon he began to see how the auctioneer could talk so rapidly. He said, oh my, it's do or die, I've got to learn that auction cry, gotta make my mark and be an auctioneer. Twenty-five dollar bid, and I'll thirty dollar thirty, will you give me thirty, make it thirty, bid a mama thirty dollar, will you give me thirty, who didn't bid a thirty dollar bid? Thirty dollar bid, and I'll thirty-five, will you give me thirty-five, to make it thirty-five, to bid a thirty-five, who would have bid it at a thirty-five dollar bid? And all could see he didn't just he practice calling it both night and day. His pap would find him behind the barn just working up an awful storm as he tried to imitate the auctioneer. Then his pap said, son, we just can't stand to have a mediocre man selling things at auction using our good name.
Some used car dealers come on pretty strong, and some women like that, but that's not me. I'm a used car dealer who's not afraid to show his emotions. I mean, when I sell a quality used car for only $99 down, or finance someone who's had credit problems, when I see those happy faces, I... Sorry. So please, when you need a used car, let me be there for you. Don Foss, seven Detroit area locations. Don Foss, with a message for men only. When I'm not whitewater rafting or putting out oil rig blazes, there's nothing I like better than selling quality used cars to real men. And just between us guys, I've got some cars that are babe magnets for as low as $99 down. And if you got credit problems, so what? I can finance you? Hey, we're all guys, right? So when you need a used car, come and see the man's man, Don Foss. It doesn't get any better than this.